We're going to work on Chapter 5 here, the system unit. It's the guts of the computer. It's the hardware. It's the electronics inside. So let's get busy. The system unit is basically that piece of plastic that holds everything together. It's the stuff on the outside. Um, in about 19, late 1990s, 99, 2000, Apple came out and started modifying their cases. That's the plastic I'm talking about. That's the system unit that stands on your floor, um, holds everything. Um, they're finding out that people now buy based upon looks. So when you go out to purchase, this the, the, one of the reasons for this unit is to make sure that you look inside of the computer because that's really why you're buying it and that's what the costs are about not the piece of plastic or the system unit that houses and controls everything. Yeah, you want something that's going to look um, elegant in your room or whatever you're going for and you want to pick certain colors but really the memory and the processor, everything inside is what you should be buying the computer for. The motherboard here is the main circuit board or the main unit that basically um, holds all the circuitry. It's the principal component. That's probably why we call it the motherboard. Uh, you see all the slots there in the images. There's the, the rectangular slot is where you're going to put your processor. You've got your heat sink. You've got your um, ex uh, expansion cards. Um, this is inside your system unit, usually screwed to the side um, on the side panel, then everything will fit into it. So this is like your foundation of your house. Um, the better the motherboard, the printed circuits that contain you know, all your components on there um, with all the slots and all the ports sticking out the back of your computer, the better your computer is going to be. Now, we talked about the system case and the outside. Yeah, that's great. But this is your first step to getting and making a great computer, the motherboard. Your circuitry, your CM, uh, your uh, central processing unit, your CPU, that's that chip that fits on your motherboard. Um, so your motherboard's the foundation. This right here is your brains. Um, this gets things going. It clicks. It contains a control unit, which we'll learn in the next slide, and an arithmetic logic unit on the other. Okay, this is another major purchase. The better the CPU, the more information you can chunk up, um, the faster it can process, the faster it's displayed on your screen. Um, so now we're going, see, we have the case outside, we got the motherboard, and now we have the brains that are sitting on it called the CPU. Heat sink is what sits on top of your chip because the chip gets real hot. And so if you see here, the heat goes to the end of the metal and sometimes there's a fan that blows across or it's mounted to the top and it pulls the heat off of the CPU so it doesn't overheat itself 
and blows it into your your system unit and there's a, probably a fan on the back of your system unit that sucks the heat out of the inside. Um, so heat sinks are very important, okay? Now let's look at some of the two functions of the CPU. There's two parts of it, the control unit and the arithmetic logic unit. And you see here, everything has to come from memory. Um, your input, your output devices, your storage device loads to memory, which we haven't got talked, we haven't talked about that yet, but it's like the holies of holy. Everything has to go um, into the memory and the memory then can walk into the processor, processor area um, and communicate the CPU. You're not gonna get anything going from a, um, let's say a camera going right to the processor. It has to go into the memory and the memory handles it. So as you see here, the processor then will have um, two functions once it gets from the memory to there. Um, they're different operations. Um, one's arithmetic and one's basically day-to-day -day operation coordinates um, your operations on your computer. The machine cycle basically is how many steps in order to create or process information. And you'll see it's always, you're going to need to know this for the test, it's always fetch, decode, execute, and store. You see in the middle circle here as it goes around in the memory. So it fetches the information it needs. Step two, it's going to decode it into your control unit. Then it's going to pass on the calculations. Let's say we're doing 100 times 48. Um, it's going to execute it, and then it's going to store it and back out. Okay. That's the machine cycle that happens every time, and it's spinning really fast, so you might not notice it, but if we talk about a machine cycle, you can speed it up or speed it down. It all depends what you want to do. In the next one, we're going to see how we speed up that machine cycle by using multiple steps. How we speed up our computer by using a process called a pipelining. Without pipelining, you see the graphic there, it does one execution of the four steps, and then it does another one. Well, that takes a while. If you look at the graphic just below it, where it's talking about pipelining, um, as it's fetching, it's also decoding, and it's also executing, and it's also storing. So it's actually taking four instructions at the time, which allows the computer to speed up pipelining. As you get that system clock going and you sped it up, you can actually increase it if you know what you're doing, but you've got to make sure that you keep it cool. Um, you see in these pictures here, I've got some major fans that sit on top of the CPU. Um, there's some heat sinks, and the one's water-cooled. Basically, it pulls the heat off the top of the processor because you've got it. You got the system clock timing going, and it might be overclocked. Um, and then that system has to keep it cool. So basically, it's not the system clock that you look for the time. It's the system clock that measures how fast your processor and the instructions are going. You don't want to overclock it because it can burn up if you don't have the right, um, if you don't have the right cooling system inside.
A lot of students tend to get the parallel processing mixed up with the pipelining, which I mentioned earlier. Parallel processing is not doing multiple instructions on one processor. It's multiple processors that are chunking up information. So now, instead of just having uh, one processor in four different steps or stages of this clock cycle. Now you have four processors at different stages chunking up information and then they combine their results. So on massive, uh, in, in, in massive parallel processing involves hundreds of thousands of computers, but you can also do it on a small computer at home where you have two or three different processors um, working on your computer chunking up information. All right, now we're going to get into data or data representation. There's analog and digital. When I was young, uh, my mother used to take my temperature with a um, mercury uh, thermometer. She would shake it down, and we never knew exactly what my temperature was, but we knew if it was over 100, 102, that I had some type of a fever. Uh, my children, I take it with a digital. The mercury was an analog. With a digital, I can put a gun right to their little thermometer gun right to their head and go boom. Uh, it's 99 or it's 102, so I know exactly where their uh, temperature is. Analog and digital are two different. Computers are digital. Analog is not, it's not an exact position. If you look at the graphic there, analog can be in between. Digital has to be either zeros and ones, and most computers, all computers I know of, are digital. And digital system is based on two. It's either a zero or one, and we're going to show you and build on what is digital here in the next couple slides. But your car stereo where it says 98 point whatever exactly, that's a digital radio. An analog is where you had that little dial with an orange line that went right down the center and you kind of moved it around until you found your radio station that you wanted to have. Most cameras are digital because, you know, you put the disc in and there's a digital picture. If it's on film, if you take pictures with a camera on film, that's analog. Now, the, the beauty about analog is especially in a picture, it can probably grasp colors that the digital can't. Because remember, digital has to say, is it this color or it's this color? It doesn't have an in-between. Same with music. Uh, digital music recording is different than an analog because you can get those in-between notes, those in-between colors. There's a, there's a data representative called Unicode, or there's ASCII. And just for this class, you'll see a video either before or after this talking about the Unicode data and what it did with ASCII. But basically, it is a conversion. You see there, we, we're going to get in and break into bytes and bits. And bits is the smallest representation of data. And then you have bytes, which is the grouping of eight bits together. So if you see in here, 
there is the first one for the letter zero is zero zero one one zero 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 is equal to the symbol zero. That's how the computers chunk it up. Um, now there's eight bits there, okay, to create a byte, okay. And so what we did is we created for all computers a standard language. Um, if you look at the N, the symbol N, it's zero one zero zero one 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 zero. Um, it's quite easy. Um, that's how your computer represents data throughout the channels. Because remember, either the light is on or off. In the olden days, they used to use vacuum tubes for suction. Um, had some problems with that. But now we are using circuitry with electronics. Either the power is on or off. And that's how your computer represents everything on the screen. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. The big daddy, or big mama, whatever you want to say, inside your computer, we talked about the processor, we talked about the motherboard, we've talked about the cooling fans, we talked about the data representation and how it th goes to the circuit board, but I touched on it earlier, is your memory. Nothing can go from your, right to your CPU, it has to go through the memory. So the faster and the more space you have in memory, your CPU doesn't have to slow down. Okay, so if your CPU slows down, your whole computer slows down. So remember, when you're purchasing a computer, it's more than just the system unit of the piece of plastic. It's also your memory. How much memory do you have? And is it able to keep up with your processor? Those are two biggies when you keep thinking about it. Because what is stored in your memory? First off, your operating system, when you boot up, if you're a Windows machine, you notice that it takes a little bit for your computer to start up. And you see the Windows symbol going on and off, on and off, on and off. That's because it's loading kernels and information into your memory. Not everything, but some. So it's taking up some of your memory. When you open up Microsoft Word, some of that of the software Microsoft Word gets loaded into, into the memory. Okay, so now we're starting to take advantage of some information. Now when you're typing or saving processing information that's data, that's also saving information into your memory. So we have all this saved into temporary memory because you remember these green chips, this memory, it goes away. When the power goes off, it goes away. So we call it RAM. RAM scrams when the power goes off and ROM sticks around. Remember that saying. We're going to cover memory here in a little bit and you're probably going to hear it more than you ever wanted to. But your memory, these green chips that sit on your motherboard in a little slot, when the power goes off, everything in there goes away. But it does have to hold a lot of information when the power is on. And it will slow down your computer if, if it doesn't have enough places to store everything. All right, here we go. We're going to be talking about the difference between RAM and ROM. RAM is, no, uh, I'm sorry, ROM is non-volatile memory. Basically, you won't lose it like CD-ROM on your computer disk that you have. RAM, you will. So it's volatile. So it means when the power goes off, it scrams. Remember, RAM scrams, ROM sticks around. Those memory chips that we talked about in the last slide, that would be RAM. ROM would be something on your hard drive storage. Okay. Here we are looking then again at memory, and this is RAM because the power goes off, it goes away. And you see there, there's sockets it fits into the motherboard, and there's certain ways it has to fit in based upon where those grooves are. 
It's real easy to install memory, but you just got to remember not to, um, you have, you have to dis, dis, discharge, sorry, you have to discharge the um, static electricity because if you have static electricity in your body holding a RAM chip and you touch it to your motherboard, you could basically fry your motherboard. That's the only problem. A way to get around it is to always touch the power source inside your computer with it on plug, please. Um, that will discard, discharge the static electricity. Keep your hand there and just put those into the slots. Again, you got to make sure that the edge is in the right way and that you have your socket profile or your little edges, your little grooves that are at the bottom align perfectly with the way they are in the motherboard. This picture is a good example of basically memory getting placed into the slot. So these are your RAM chips um, residing in your memory module slots on your motherboard. So you have to do it internally inside your CPU. We talked about browser cache in chapter two. Now we're going to talk about memory cache. It's the same thing anytime you see the word cache, C-A-C-H-E. You're talking about a temporary storage place for um, instructions that are commonly used that you can bring back up. Um, if you were a math teacher, your brain is able to, uh, your math facts are crazy, the ability to add and subtract on the fly because you're always doing it in a classroom. So basically your brain has kind of cached some of the math sequences and calculations that you can kind of picture and do quickly. That's similar to memory cache where it's a special place for things that are commonly used often. Another type of memory that you're going to see out in the computer world is your flash memory. You probably recognize the flash memory as your little USB, but there's also flash memory in a lot of different devices that are out there. Um, it's basically, there's really not many movable parts inside. It's electronic, non um, uh, it's going to stay in there. A volatile type of system, a non-volatile, no moving parts. It's not RAM, it's ROM. Um, we were basically introduced, I think this was pretty fascinating, by Toshiba in 1984. Um, you can see the image right there. And then there's also a CMOS, uh, which uses a little battery. Usually you can tell, and they hold little instructions. Usually it's uh, for the startup information in your computer. That's a different type of memory, and it's not erasable. Okay, So you can, as long as the battery's there and it resets, you don't need to go through all that information. But there's some more memory here, um, the flash memory and the CMOS. Memory is measured in access time um, in nanoseconds, and it's the amount of time it takes a process to read from the memory. So remember, if it slows down, we've got problems. Um, and basically, if you look at it, it's, if it's measured in nanoseconds, 10 million operations in one, uh, one blink, um, and your computer is doing a lot faster than that. So that's just a little perspective look at how fast memory has to go, measured in nanoseconds. Um, and remember, we talked about it earlier, if we don't want our CPU to slow down. Um, it's an incredible eating machine, so your processor can eat up as fast as you can give it, hopefully, and your RAM has to keep feeding it. Now as we come out a little bit onto our motherboard again and get out of the memory and the CPU, um, there's expansion slots. You see there, I have a, you can have a sound card that's an expansion. It's an extra peripheral 
Um, and the adapters go in the motherboard and the ports stick out the back. So you see a little diagram of a USB. Oh, it looks like a USB um, expansion card. It could be um, more of a high speed or it could be a firewire, but I think it's a USB. And it plugs into your expansion card on your motherboard and the ports are in the back. That's where you plug into them. So um, these are expansion cards. Uh, sound and video cards used to be the most popular. Um, and that's usually what we're using your expansion cards for because the basic ones that are built onto your motherboard aren't that powerful. So if you're like running dual or quad monitors at the same time, you're probably going to have an expansion card with um, high DVI so you can plug in four monitors and run them at the same time. Plug and play. Um, it's basically where you plug in a, uh, something through a, a peripheral device into your computer and the drivers are already there and so it just the computer from your OS picks it up and away it goes, kind of like a USB recognition. Uh, Microsoft got in trouble a couple years ago because they're regulating who could be included, what device drivers could be included in the OS. So when you plugged it in, it started right up because nobody wants to buy a peripheral that you have to load something and then go through this program and it doesn't work. You just want to plug it in and it works. That's where you got the plug and play. More flash memory here. You've got your USB card again. You've got your different types. You know, you got your PCMCIA card, which usually goes in laptops. Don't see that too much. You've got your um, little flat, your little uh, micro. Um, uh, I, I'm losing the name here, but your little micro cards, um, stuff that you put in your uh, cell phones, to stuff you might put in a camera, um, to the larger one, the compact flash that you put in some of the older cameras. You're seeing more of the uh, the ultra and then the, the micro uh, smaller chips. We're really coming out of the inside guts of your computer. And in the back side of your computer where all the dust bunnies are, you'll see that we have ports. We also call them jacks. And each port has a color code and a shape that means something. And, that, and in the next couple slides, you're going to have some identifiers so that you can see um, the round ones are certain serial ports. Where's your uh, DVI to where's your um, uh, high density uh, SATA drive connection or your Ethernet connection. Um, these are the ports, the stuff on the back where the dust bunnies are, your connectors. You do need to make yourself familiar with some of these ports. Um, some of them are old and not used, like the parallel port or the serial port. We still have them. Um, the PS2 port, but we do have an Ethernet and modem port still, and you can see this universal sim symbol for USB as well as FireWire and some of your sound um, and some of your eSATA and your display ports. Those you should be familiar with, your HDMI. Um, you notice that the digital video interface is a square, and it's got these, you know, it's got pins, little little squares in there going across with a little thing on the right for the plug-in. Um, USB has the, usually the rectangle with the USB-B port, which is the, the smaller square and so forth and so on. Um, especially when you go to the a store, if you need a part, you should always know the dimensions and the shape of it and make sure that you can plug your peripheral into something that you have. Um, most commonly when you're setting up your um, audio, your entertainment center, you when you buy a TV, you want to make sure that you have um, that you have enough display ports or your high definition uh, HDMIs because you can plug your VCR and your cable box, stuff like that. Um, but those are all ports and connectors on the back of your computer or your electronic devices. Here you see your laptop. They also have ports, but they're usually on the side. Um, we're getting less and less ports. Usually you're seeing your um, some, if you're lucky, you have an Ethernet, an HDMI, and a USB. A lot of them are just condensing down to a mini USB or a USB and making you use Wi-Fi in your laptops. Um, but some here's some of the ports, or you can have a pigtail, which is an adapter that plugs maybe into your USB, and then you can then have an Ethernet cable on the plug-in or a female on the end of that cable. Um, so laptops do have ports as well. Here again, we have a whole series of USB 2s and 3s and, and a hub. 
big part about the hub is you can plug in multiple USBs and then have one connection the, uh, to your own computer. So one end plugs in the computer, then you can put in your printer and your scanner all in there. That's what we're talking about, the hub. That's the image on the left. And then you see the USB 2, the shapes and the forms, as well as the USB 3. Um, all deals with uh, the connection. USB ports, again, here's a test question, can connect up to 127 different peripherals together with a single connection, kind of daisy chaining them together. And finally, as we start coming totally out, we had the system unit, the piece of plastic, um, but also in there are shelving, which we call bays. You can see um, on the images here, there's empty bays. Um, that's the shelving inside of the uh, CPU or the, uh, the system unit, the piece of metal or plastic. Um, it's for additional uh, drives or um, if you so need um, hard drives or CD-ROMs, which are tending to die out lately. But um, you need to be familiar with where the bays are. They're all inside um, where you can screw. There's little screws you attach to these racks and keeps it all neat and proper.